Um, what I'd like to do is to provide brief background for Ellen Crummy for her thesis defense today. Today, the longest day of the year, is uh, filled with uncertainty. I don't think we yet know whether the U.S. government will be open tomorrow or not. So I thought we'd spend the next hour on a topic of greater certainty, biochemistry and protein-protein interactions. And uh, Ellen will tell you about a novel protein-protein interaction that she developed, that she characterized. Um, Ellen um, was born in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I'm tempted to guess that that's where she learned her baking skills. <laughs> We've been the happy recipients of her baking skills, and I've always associated ability to bake with ability to do biochemistry and, and vice versa. I don't know if that's false or not. But anyway, um, we've been the recipient of Ellen's baking skills. She's been progressively going west from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Her first stop as an undergraduate student being at Case Western Reserve University, where she was um, a major in biochemistry. She was quite busy there. She was on the swimming team, and I noticed uh, from a website that her times in the backstroke progressively decreased over the four-year undergraduate period of time. <laughs> However, and maybe more importantly, she also conducted research. She conducted research in the laboratory of Ruth Siegel in the pharmacology department for about a year and a half, something like that. And the topic of interest was studies of the GABA ion channel receptor. They were interested in studying the GABA receptor for its potential role in the adaptive response to hypoxia in terms of affecting the respiratory system. Um, Ellen conducted a fair amount of PCR work as well as mouse husbandry work. And it turned out that the project was then published in Brain and Behavior with, with the following sort of bottom lines. The, the mouse knockout that had the particular GABA subunit knocked out didn't really show very much modulation of respiratory control. However, Ellen found that other subunits were adaptively upregulated in this mouse. The neat finding was that the mouse experienced increased anxiety. So when Ellen came to Madison further west, she joined my laboratory, presumably because of some interest in neurobiology, and also to not have to work with mice or anxiety. <laughs> However, um, there was a fair amount of anxiety associated with her project, I have to say. Uh, basically, she undertook an ambitious project of defining a protein-protein interaction for CAPS. Now, CAPS, as she'll tell you, is a protein we discovered many years ago in my laboratory. And in my laboratory, we consider it to be the center of the universe in terms of function of dense core secretory granules and their fusion and other activities of the dense core vesicle. So um, Ellen was able to take some initial findings in the lab and um, bring them to a point of completion in defining a no novel CAPS protein interaction. I, n I noted in her graduate school application, she saw an analogy between swimming and conducting research in the laboratory that both require a substantial amount of patience in order to get good at it. And I have to say that Ellen has been remarkably patient in what turned out to be a fairly long-term project. So with that, um, that's the title of her work. Let her have at it.
Thank you, Tom, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for coming today or for listening online. Today, I'm going to be talking about my work on this protein CAPS and its role in the regulated exocytic pathway. I'm going to tell you a story about how CAPS interacts with this protein, rabconnectin 3 beta or WDR7, and how both of these proteins are involved in modulating the acidity of dense core vesicles. However, before I begin talking about CAPS, we'll take a couple steps back and start by talking about the regulated secretory pathway and an overview of it. Why is it important? What cell types have it? We'll then talk about the discovery of CAPS, which, as Tom mentioned, was discovered in his lab a number of years ago. That will lead into background information about the protein CAPS and what was known about it when we began this project and what inspired this work. I'll then talk about my research, of course, and show you my data, and we'll wrap up with some future directions and ways that this project can be taken forward even further. So as I mentioned, today we're going to be talking about the regulated exocytic pathway. But I think it's important to know that all of the cells in your body have a pathway by which they can secrete molecules, such as extracellular matrix proteins and growth factors. This pathway is called constitutive secretion. And in it, cargo proteins cluster together in the Golgi, bud off of the Golgi, and immediately and rapidly fuse with the plasma membrane. This process is extremely rapid, and it's happening in all of your cells all of the time. It was actually years after they discovered regulated exocytosis that constitutive secretory vesicles were purified because of how rapid the turnover is. You might imagine that certain cells in your body secrete important signaling molecules that you wouldn't want to be released at this kind of uh, rapid, unregulated manner. These cell types include, say, pancreatic beta cells that secrete insulin. They include neurons that secrete neurotransmitters and neuroendocrine cells that secrete hormones. These cells have an additional pathway that's called the regulated exocytic pathway. And after vesicles bud from the Golgi containing their cargo, they traffic to the plasma membrane. But instead of immediately fusing, they pause there and wait for a physiological signal. There's a number of cell types that contain this regulated exocytic pathway. And I'm showing you two of them here. These are electron micrographs of neurons and a neuroendocrine cell. In it, you can see the membrane enclosed compartments. So in this neuron, you can see a number of these synaptic vesicles. These synaptic vesicles are clustered around this active zone. And upon a calcium influx, they will fuse here and secrete their neurotransmitter contents into the synapse to allow for neurotransmission to take place. We know a lot about the um, process of synaptic vesicle exocytosis. And a lot of what we know about the secretion of neurotransmitters has been extrapolated into other systems, such as the secretion of contents from dense core vesicles. So our lab is interested in secretion for these dense core vesicles. And you can see one of them in this, neuro in this neuron and a number of them in this neuroendocrine cell. So it's hard to tell from this picture, but dense core vesicles are actually significantly larger than synaptic vesicles. And they contain different kinds of signaling molecules, such as hormones and catecholamines. The pathway for dense core vesicle exocytosis looks something like this. Cargo gets clustered together in the Golgi, and an immature secretory vesicle buds from there. This clustering of cargo is actually important for the formation of the immature secretory granule, and is reliant upon properties of these proteins, as well as the slight acidic pH of the trans-Golgi. After budding from the Golgi, this immature vesicle will undergo a number of maturation steps before it's ready to fuse with the plasma membrane. These maturation steps include exchanging the proteins from the plasma membrane, taking the Golgi proteins off and putting on proteins that are relevant for plasma membrane fusion. The vesicle will become larger, and it will become more dense as additional cargo proteins are pumped in. But importantly for what we're going to talk about today, these vesicles are actually acidified. So this acidification process takes place via this proton pump called VATPase which hydrolyzes ATP in exchange for pumping protons against their gradient into the lumen of the dense core vesicle. This process is important for these immature secretory granules because a acidic lumen is required for the pumping in of certain signaling molecules, such as catecholamines, whose transporter relies on the acidic pH, as well as for the processing of hormones. So in order for a pro-hormone to be converted to its active state, Enzymes need to cleave it, and they require, again, this acidic pH. So when a vesicle buds from the Golgi, its pH will be around 6.4. And by the time it's ready to fuse with the plasma membrane, it will be around 5.5. 5. 5. 
After it has trafficked to the plasma membrane, it will sit and wait for this physiological calcium signal, upon which time it will fuse with the plasma membrane. This final step in regulated exocytosis has been of a lot of interest for researchers for a number of years, and that's because the fusion of two lipid bilayers together is an extremely energetically unfavorable process. And so it follows that there would be certain proteins that would need to catalyze this opening of a fusion pore. And scientists were, of course, interested what these proteins were. In the early 90s, the snare proteins were discovered to be these molecular machines that are required for fusion. There are three snare proteins involved in this system. There's one on the vesicle and then two on the plasma membrane. The snare proteins begin by interacting at their end terminus. And upon a calcium influx, they zipper up from their end to their transmembrane C terminus. And in the process, pull the, pull the two membranes together so tightly that the lipids begin to mix and a fusion pore opens through which the contents can be released. Prior to this fusion step, I'm notating this docking and priming step. Docking and priming describes a state in which the snare proteins have begun to interact with each other and the vesicle is held close to the plasma membrane, but the snare proteins have not begin to, begun to zipper up. It's thought to be important that the vesicle is near the plasma membrane and that the snare proteins are partially formed such that upon a calcium signal, the vesicle can fuse with the plasma membrane very rapidly. So it was around this time that scientists were interested in learning more about these snare proteins that my lab was also interested in learning about what was happening around the fusion pore. And so they developed this permeabilized neuroendocrine cell assay in which they took cells and pushed them through a homogenizer. This homogenization tore a single hole in the plasma membrane of these cells through which all of the cytoplasmic components could be washed out, leaving only this ghost cell that contained vesicles and organelles, but no cytosol. They then stimulated these cells to see if they could secrete these dense core vesicle contents. But as it turned out, there was a very modest response. There was very little secretion. However, when they added back those cytosolic components that they had emptied out of the cell, they saw that there was this large recovery of secretion, this robust secretory response. And this said that in addition to those three snare proteins I showed you on the last slide, that there are additional soluble factors that are also required for dense core vesicle exocytosis. Of course, they were interested in what these um, soluble factors were, and so they used size exclusion chromatography, testing all of the eluates in this secretion assays to see which one reconstituted the secretory phenotype. They were able to purify these eluates down to homogeneity and found that a single protein was able to reconstitute this secretion. And of course, that protein is the topic of my talk today called CAPS. So over the years, a number of, uh, different, a number of different fusion assays have been done with this protein CAPS, and I'm just showing you one of them here. So in a normal neuroendocrine cell, after you stimulate it, there will be a certain number of fusion events over a period of time. But if you knock down caps, the ability of these dense core vesicles to fuse uh, goes down significantly. There's barely any fusion events at all. This has been shown in not only this cell type, but additional cell types. Homologs in Drosophila and C. elegans also require um, caps in order to secrete dense core vesicles. If you knock caps out of mice, the mice die at birth. And all of these, um, all of these facts say that caps is a vital protein for the secretion of dense core vesicle contents. A significant amount of work over the past 26 years has gone into trying to figure out exactly what CAPS is doing and why it's so um, necessary for dense core vesicle exocytosis. It's been found to be a so-called priming factor. And priming factors are soluble components that interact with the vesicle or the snares or the plasma membrane and kind of set the stage such that upon a calcium influx, the snare pro proteins can zipper up in a way that's conducive to fusion. Without priming factors, the snare proteins form non-productive complexes, and the vesicles are not able to fuse with the plasma membrane. We know a lot about this protein caps. We know that via this Monk homology domain that it binds all three of the snare proteins. We know that via its pH domain, it interacts with the plasma membrane. And again, we know that it is a vital priming factor for dense core vesicle exocytosis. <coughs> However, at the time that I started in this lab, there were a couple papers in the literature that suggested that maybe CAPS plays additional roles upstream of its role as a priming factor. 
And I'm showing you two of these papers here. This per first paper shows that when you knock down caps in this neuroendocrine cell line, that there is some kind of defect in the formation of immature granules. So here is a normal cell, and you can see that this fluorescent dense core vessel cargo is packaged and shipped out to the cell periphery. Whereas in CAPS knockdown cells, the cargo seems to be trapped in the trans-Golgi, suggesting that there's a defect in the formation of immature granules. The second paper demonstrates that if you knock down CAPS, there's a defect in loading catecholamines into granules. So here I'm showing you in CAPS uh, knockdown cells that they are unable to load as much serotonin as wild-type cells. All of these assays suggested that CAPS had this additional function upstream of its priming role. However, um, not, there was no real mechanistic reason as far as how CAPS could be performing these other functions. It kind of reminded us, though, of something that we've known in our lab for quite a number of years now. I'm showing you this really nice sim image that was done by Declan and Aaron in our lab. And you can see if you antibody stain CAPS and you antibody stain a vesicle marker, that CAPS localizes to vesicles extremely well. And you can see that in this merge image where the localization is depicted in yellow. So this is kind of weird, though, because CAPS is a soluble protein. And further, it's performing its action at the plasma membrane. So why would CAPS be interacting with these vesicles? And further, what is it bound to? Again, it's soluble, so it must have an interaction partner on these vesicles in order for it to localize there. We thought that if we learned more about what factors CAPS was interacting with on dense core vesicles, that we could learn more about these functions that it had upstream of its priming role. Therefore, in order to address this question, I performed co-immunoprecipitations from rat brains that were enriched in membrane. Brains are very, have, have a lot of CAPS in them, but the issue is that about 60% of it is soluble. I wanted to have my input material be very enriched in membranes because it would also be enriched in the CAPS binding partner that tethered it to membranes. So I made these synaptosomal fractions, which are just pinched off nerve endings that contain vesicles, mitochondria, as well as plasma membrane. I broke open these synaptosomes using detergent, and I bound a CAPS antibody to beads. And I used this antibody to fish out endogenous CAPS and see what proteins it was interacting with. I ran my eluates from the beads on a, on a gel which I Kumasi stained. And as you can see, along with caps, I get a number of other proteins. I also see a number of proteins that I get in control conditions, where I bound a non-immune rabbit IgGs to beads and saw what stuck non-specifically. I was, of course, curious what these other proteins were. And so in order to analyze putative interaction partners, I submitted my sample for mass spec analysis. When I got my data back, I sorted it using spectral counting, which is a label-free method to measure protein abundance. Here I'm graphing the spectral counts in CAPS immunoprecipitation conditions and control conditions. Therefore, the proteins that we're interested in lie along this x-axis, and things that were maybe there for nonspecific reasons lie along this middle line or down here towards the control condition. You can see I got a lot of CAPS, so that was good. Um, and you can also see this protein rabconnectin 3 alpha. And its subunit is buried a little bit further down here, rabconnectin 3 beta. And these proteins were very robust. Each time I did this assay, these two proteins kept coming up, rabconnectin 3 alpha, rabconnectin 3 beta. And so I wanted to know um, a little bit more about maybe the stoichiometry between CAPS and these two putative binding partners. So instead of running my entire eluates on, on mass spec, instead I ran the eluates on an SDS page gel, stained the gel with Kumasi, and cut out bands that I could see in my CAPS IP, but not in my control IPs. I then had these bands analyzed with mass spec, and again, I saw this rabconnectin 3 alpha protein and rabconnectin 3 beta protein, and found them corresponding to distinct bands. I measured the intensity of these bands and compared it to the intensity of this CAPS band, and found the stoichiometry to be one, uh, six molecules of CAPS per one molecule of rabconnectin-3, which seemed like a pretty promising ratio for um, an interaction partner stoichiometry. I also got a number of these VATPA subunits, as well as this verified CAPS interaction partner, SNAP25. 
I was still very curious about this Rab Connectin 3 complex, and before I further pursued it, I really wanted to make sure that these proteins were not present in control conditions, that they weren't there for nonspecific reasons. So I obtained antibodies for Rab Connectin 3 alpha and Rab Connectin 3 beta, and I performed CAPS immunoprecipitations and saw that when I IP'd CAPS, I was able to get both proteins as well as components of VATPase complex, but not in control conditions, indicating that these proteins are interacting with CAPS and not with the beads. Finally, I wanted to make sure that there was nothing kind of strange going on with my CAPS antibody. And so I obtained an antibody for Rab Connectin 3 that uh, immunoprecipitated the alpha subunit. I was able to see that when I immunoprecipitated Rab Connectin 3 alpha, that I was also able to pull down CAPS, showing that the CoIP goes in the opposite direction. So together, all of this data says that the Rab Connectin 3 complex robustly and reproducibly immunoprecipitates with CAPS, and that the alternate is true, that CAPS immunoprecipitates with the Rab Connectin 3 complex. And so this is, these are the protein complexes that, or the protein complex that I further pursued. But before I jump into all of that data, let's take a moment and talk about what exactly Rab Connectin 3 is. So the Rab Connectin 3 complex is composed of two proteins that exist at a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. There's the alpha subunit, which is also called DMXL2, as well as the beta subunit, which is also called WDR7. Both of these proteins contain a number of WD40 repeat domains, and each of these repeats forms this beta sheet. And when there are five to seven of these um, repeats in a row or near each other, they form this plate-like structure. These plate structures um, are thought to be important protein-protein interaction hubs because there's so much surface area for many proteins to interact on. And so I was excited by this. I thought, okay, this makes sense that CAPS is interacting with this protein interaction hub because there's a lot of proteins that are coming onto and off of vesicles um, as it's maturing and going towards the plasma membrane. However, I got even more excited about this domain called the RAV domain, because the RAV domain is thought to be involved in interacting with VATPase and mediated, mediating proton pumping. I talked about VATPase in some of my intro slides. VATPase is a large protein complex that hydrolyzes ATP in exchange for pumping protons into the lumen of vesicles. VATPase is present on not only dense core vesicles, but also endosomes and Golgi and lysosomes and other acidic compartments. So because it's pretty abundant and because it can use up a lot of cellular ATP, you can imagine that it's important that this complex is regulated, that it's not just always using up ATP or pumping protons into, say, an, a compartment that was already acidic enough. Therefore, this complex can be regulated and it can be regulated via the dissociation of this V1 domain. So uh, in conditions in which it's not favorable for the, the VATPase to pump protons anymore, the V1 domain will come off the membrane-bound V0 domain. And in this conformation, protons cannot be pumped and ATP cannot be hydrolyzed. The issue, though, is that while it's pretty easy for VATPase to fall apart, it's a little bit harder for it to get back together. And the reason for that is thought to be these side domains, E and G, which need to be bent into place in order to fit securely on top of this v naught domain. Therefore, studies in yeast have shown that there's a protein complex that's needed in order to guide this V1 back onto the v naught to form a stable complex and allow proton pumping. This complex is called the RAVE complex, and its central subunit is this RAV1P protein, which looks a lot like DMXL2 uh, slash Rab Connectin 3 alpha, in that it contains both a Rab domain as well as a number of WD40 repeats. So due to its homology to this um, yeast protein, a lot of studies on this Rab Connectin 3 alpha, Rab Connectin 3 beta proteins were undertaking trying to look to see if it also mediates VATPase proton pumping. It was found that both of these proteins interact with VATPA subunits. That knockdown of both of these proteins cause defects in vesicle acidification in various organisms. And that the presumed function of these two proteins is conserved from yeast, that they positively regulate VATPA's assembly and therefore positively regulate proton pumping. The reason that this finding was so exciting to us is because both of these papers on CAPS in the literature 
could be explained by a defect in acidification. So the formation of immature secretory granules is reliant upon a slight, uh, the slight acidity of the transgolgi. The pumping of serotonin into dense core vesicles is reliant upon the acidity of the dense core vesicle in order for the transporter to pump in the catecholamines. Therefore, our idea was that CAPS interacted with rabconnectin-3 complex and that through this interaction mediated the VATPA's acidification of dense core vesicles. When I was a couple years into this project, somebody actually came out um, to say that indeed CAPS does influence the pH gradient of vesicles. So this paper shows um, these hippocampal neurons and when they knocked out CAPS using shRNA, they found that the pH of the dense core vesicles in these hippocampal neurons was increased from about 5.8 to about 6.8. And so this demonstrates that CAPS is somehow involved in the acidification of dense core vesicles. However, these authors were unable to propose any kind of mechanism as far as how it could be performing this role. Therefore, my project became a way to try and explain how CAPS could influence the ATPase proton pumping, as well as potentially the loading of catecholamines into vesicles. The first step into um, trying to show this hypothesis was to see whether rabconnectin-3 was actually on dense core vesicles in the first place. So I used this neuroendocrine cell line that was expressing this dense core vesicle marker that was tagged with a GFP protein. I then stained these cells with antibodies using rab, uh, against rabconnectin-3 alpha and rabconnectin-3 beta and found that these proteins localized pretty well to dense core vesicles. You can see areas where rabconnectin-3 alpha and beta are not localized to vesicles and that's because they are also found on endosomes and so these, these areas where they're not co-localizing are likely endosomes. Of course, the whole reason that we started this project was because we were interested in the protein that was tethering CAPS to dense core vesicles. And so we wanted to know if rabconnectin-3 was responsible for CAPS localization to dense core vesicles. In order to test this, I worked with a postdoc in our lab, um, Manny, and did these assays in which you expressed, we, we had these cells that were stably expressing this NPY-GFP dense core vesicle cargo protein, as well as this fluorescent CAPS molecule, caps mk under control conditions in which we transfected the cells with non-targeting siRNA, you can see really good co-localization between CAPS and the NPY-GFP vesicles. However, if you knock out rabconnectin-3-alpha or rabconnectin-3-beta using siRNA, you can see a significant redistribution of CAPS from the dense core vesicles into the cytoplasm. And this can be quantitated using Pearson's coefficient by measuring um, which tells you about the localization between two fluorescent constructs. So here in non-targeting conditions, you can see the Pearson's coefficient is quite high, but upon knocking out rabconnectin-3 alpha and beta, there is a significant decrease in the amount of caps that's localizing to dense core vesicles. Another way of looking, this, looking at this data is asking whether caps is in a punctate conformation or whether it's cytoplasmic. In non-targeting conditions, 80% of caps is punctate um, presumably on the dense core vesicles. However, in rabconnectin-3 beta knockdown conditions, only about 45% of CAPS is actually localized to vesicles. And this data says that when you knock out rabconnectin-3 beta, that there's a significant redistribution of CAPS from dense core vesicles into the cytoplasm, suggesting that it's important that rabconnectin-3 beta expression is important for proper CAPS localization. This assay kind of showed the negative, that knocking out rabconnectin-3 beta also took caps off of vesicles. But we were also interested in kind of going the other way, of seeing if rabconnectin-3 beta could recruit caps onto vesicles. And so in order to look at that, we used these cost cell lines. And cost cells don't contain any dense core vesicles. And so if you express caps in them, it's totally soluble. We expressed rabconnectin-3 alpha in these cells and found it also to be soluble. However, rabconnectin-3 beta uh, formed all these punctate structures. And we were curious if we co-expressed rabconnectin-3 beta with CAPS, whether CAPS would redistribute onto these rabconnectin-3 beta positive structures. And indeed, co-expression of both of these proteins together, CAPS and rabconnectin-3 beta, 
redistributed caps from the cytoplasm onto these rabconectin-3 structures, indicating that rabconectin-3 beta may be able to recruit caps onto vesicles. All of this data was highly suggestive that rabconectin-3 beta is involved in caps localization with vesicles. However, this did not necessarily say that these proteins were directly interacting. And so in order to figure out if these proteins made a direct interaction, I purified both CAPS and rabconectin-3 beta for direct binding assays. I purified CAPS using this streptactin system that Declan from my lab developed. And you can see I get a really nice band at the correct molecular weight. Rabconectin-3 beta is a little bit more unstable. Um, this is the correct molecular weight for rabconectin-3 beta. And although there are additional bands that you can see in this gel, I confirmed that they were breakdown products and not other protein interactions. In order to see whether these two proteins could interact with one another, I purified caps on these streptactin beads and eluded it with a biotin derivative. I then incubated caps with these beads that were bound to either rabconectin-3 beta or that were just control beads that were not bound to rabconectin-3 beta and looked to see if caps would, um, would bind these rabconectin-3 beta positive beads but not be there in control conditions. And indeed, that's what happened. When rabconectin-3 beta was present, I was able to pull out caps but not in control conditions, suggesting that these two proteins form a direct interaction. We know a lot about the functional domains of CAPS, and so we were curious where on CAPS rabconectin-3 beta interacts. In order to ask this question, I used a number of fragments that uh, Masaki from our lab designed. There's an N-terminal fragment um, that's a little bit shorter, this longer N-terminal fragment that contains a dimerization domain as well as this plasma membrane binding domain, and then a C-terminal fragment that contains this snare binding domain. In order to see which of these domains interacted with CAPS, I co-expressed CAPS, um, or the various fragments, with rabconectin-3 beta. I then lysed the cells and used an anti-HAB to pull out CAPS or fragments and look to see if rabconectin-3 beta was also pulled out of the cells. When I did this, unsurprisingly, when I pulled out full-length CAPS, I was able to see rabconectin-3 beta. However, interestingly, when I, out, when I pulled out N-terminal fragments of CAPS, the shorter N-terminal fragment as well as the longer N-terminal fragment, I seemed to get even more rabconectin-3 beta, suggesting that it was preferentially interacting with the N-terminus of CAPS. This is in contrast to a C-terminal fragment as well as control conditions in which I did not pull out any rabconectin-3 beta. Together, all of this data says that CAPS directly interacts with rabconectin-3 beta via its N-terminus. We were very curious what these two proteins were doing together in the cells, and we were very inspired by all of the assays that were suggesting that um, both CAPS and rabconectin-3 were involved in vesicle acidification. In order to see uh, whether that was true, we, made, we used knockdown cell lines in which we knocked out CAPS or rabconectin-3, and we looked at the vesicle's acidity in a couple different ways. One way was using this fluorescent probe called MINI-202, which could be loaded specifically into vesicles and whose fluorescence depended upon the pH of those vesicles. The second way was using this um, expression construct, NPY-GFP, where NPY is a dense core vesicle cargo protein that's specifically in dense core vesicles, and GFP is our pH-sensitive probe. And I'll go through each of these assays briefly. So for my first assay, again, I use this probe called MINI-202. And MINI-202 looks a lot like dopamine in that it's loaded specifically into dense core vesicles via this VMAT transporter. The nice thing about this, con this, um, this chemical is that it's actually fluorescence, fluorescent. And further, its fluorescence is dependent upon the pH of its surroundings. So if it's loaded into a very neutral vesicle, it will fluoresce brightly if you excite it at 370 nanometers. However, if it's loaded into a very acidic vesicle, it will fluoresce more brightly at 335 nanometers. Therefore, I could look at cells that had been, um, in which I had knocked out caps and, looked at, and look at control cells and compare the ratio of the fluorescence at these two wavelengths 
in order to make statements about whether or not the uh, pH of the vesicles was impacted by the knockdown condition. The first thing I did was make sure that this probe was actually loaded into dense core vesicles as it was supposed to. And so I loaded a neuroendocrine cell line with MINI-202, and I looked at it under the microscope. And you can see all of these punctate structures. I was hoping those, was, those were dense core vesicles, but to make sure, I performed another experiment in which I pre-incubated the cells with this drug called reserpine. So reserpine actually blocks this VMAT transporter, which is only present on dense core vesicles. So if I block this transporter, and this probe is only loaded into dense core vesicles, I shouldn't be able to see a signal of MINI-202. And that's what happened. And so this told me that this probe was being loaded into dense core vesicles, and any information I got about acidity would have to do with the pH of, of dense core vesicles and not, say, endosomes or other acidic compartments. The other thing I needed to make sure of is that the um, plate reader would be able to see differences in the pH. So what I did was I incubated this mini-202 compound with buffers at different pHs ranging from 4 to 8. I then read the fluorescence at 370 and 335 nanometers and took that ratio to see how it changed as I increased the buffer pH. I was able to see that as you expose mini-202 to buffers of increasing pH, that the 370 to 335 nanometer ratio increased. And this told me that I would be able to look at this ratio in cells, and if the ratio was higher, that would mean the vesicles uh, that the compound was loaded in were less acidic. So in order to do this assay, I seeded cells. I, I should say I worked with a very talented undergrad named Connor who helped me very significantly with these assays. And so we would load cells into a 96-well plate and transfect them with siRNA. We would then add mini-202 and wash the cells and read the fluorescence at 370 and 335 nanometers. We did this for control cells as well as cells in which we had knocked down caps, RAB connectin 3 alpha and RAB connectin 3 beta. And much to our disappointment, there was actually no statistical difference in cells that had been in control cells versus cells that had been knocked down that versus cells in which we had knocked down these proteins. And this was pretty disappointing to us and also pretty confusing because the literature had, had really said that these proteins were involved in the acidification of dense core vesicles. And so in order to reconcile this data and try and figure out what was going on, we went back to the literature to try and kind of figure out what we were missing. So we know VATPase fluctuates between an assembled and a disassembled state. And when it's assembled, it pumps protons. And when it's disassembled, it does not pump protons. We assume that there are stabilizing factors for VATPase, such as the RAB connectin 3 complex and CAPS. We also assumed that if we knock out some of these stabilizing factors, that we would drive the VATPase complex to this disassembled state, such that all of the vesicles in the cell would deacidify because there would be no more proton pump on them, promoting their acidity. However, it's possible that we are not completely obliterating this assembled state of VATPase when we're knocking down these stabilizing factors. This phenotype might be a little more subtle. It might drive it towards this disassembled state, but there might be some VATPase complexes that are able to assemble and able to pump prote protons, and maybe this would be enough in order to acidify the vesicle at a steady state condition. We wanted to look and see maybe if there was a more subtle phenotype, a more subtle pH phenotype. And so to do this, we basically wanted to deacidify all of the vesicles inside of a cell and see how quickly they could reacidify, see if there was a defect in the reacidification process upon knocking down these proteins. And so we did this by incubating the cells with this drug called baflomycin. Baflomycin binds the V-naught domain of VATPase, and it deacidifies the vesicles by inhibiting proton pumping and tearing apart this complex. The nice thing about baflomycin is that it's reversible. And so you can wash out this drug and then see if the vesicles are able to reacidify. So this is the scheme that we went forward with then. We added this incubation with baflomycin prior to adding mini-202 to the cells. So we basically deacidified them and gave them about um, 90 minutes to recover their pH gradient. We did this with control cells. 
and we compared the untreated cells versus cells that had been treated with baflomycin and given a period of time to recover. We could see there was a slight increase in the pH of control cells. However, it was not significantly different than cells that had not been treated with baflomycin, suggesting that the cells were able to recover their pH gradient to some extent. However, when we knocked out CAPS as well as the RAB Connectin 3 complex, there was a significant deficiency in their ability to recover their pH gradient, as indicated by these bar graphs, which are much higher than the untreated condition. Therefore, we can say that RAB Connectin 3 alpha, beta, as well as CAPS are involved in modulating the VATPase mediated acidification of dense core vesicles. There were a couple of drawbacks to this particular assay, mainly that I had to load that probe into the cells um, each time I did that experiment. I wanted to do a different sort of assay in which I didn't have to uh, load any kind of material into the vesicles. And so to do this, I used an expression construct, NPY-GFP, uh, which I expressed in a neuroendocrine cell line. NPY is a dense core vesicle cargo protein, so this would only localize two vesicles. And GFP is a pH-sensitive probe. If you image cells uh, at a low magnification, uh, NPY-GFP is actually very dim because it's inside of those vesicles that are at about a pH of 5.5. However, if you add this neutralization agent, um, ammonium chloride at a pH 7.4, you can see that these vesicles um, get brighter and therefore the whole cell gets brighter. And that's because the GFP goes from being exposed to a pH of 5.5 to a pH of 7.4, which increases its brightness. You might imagine that if I pre-incubated my cells with a drug like baflomycin, that the cells would be much brighter in the beginning and that adding ammonium chloride to them, adding this neutralization agent, would not increase their brightness anymore because they're already at, an, at a neutral pH. I wanted to kind of use this scheme to look at how much the, breast, the vesicles increase their brightness in order to make a statement about whether or not CAPS is involved in acidifying dense core vesicles. So I did these assays by capturing movies of cells before and after neutralizing them. I then identified regions of interest, um, the cells, and I measured the fluorescence intensity per cell before and after ammonium chloride neutralization. I could then calculate the ratio of GFP fluorescence, and I found that in normal cells, this ratio was about 0.4, which corresponds to the approximate threefold uh, brightening that's happening going from a pH of 5.5 to a pH of 7.4. However, in cells that I have already deacidified, I would the ratio is closer to one, corresponding to the fact that there is no additional increase in neutralization and in fluorescence intensity. When I did this assay with cells that had been knocked out from CAPS, I could not see any statistical difference between CAPS knockdown and control cells. And because I had already done the plate assay, this wasn't so surprising to me. However, if I pre-incubated the cells with baflomycin and then asked them to recover over a period of 30, 60, and 90 minutes and looked at whether they could regain their pH gradient, I could see that in control cells, while they were able to reacidify within 60 and 90 minutes, that CAPS knockdown cells were unable to reacidify to the same extent. And even by 90 minutes, they were uh, not at the level of control cells nor at the uh, same pH as when I did not add baflomycin. And again, this demonstrates that CAPS is involved in modulating the pH of dense core vesicles. And so this data brings me to my model in which CAPS interacts directly with RAB connectin 3 beta via its N terminus. Expression of RAB connectin 3 beta is necessary for CAPS proper localization to vesicles, and RAB connectin 3 beta is able to recruit CAPS onto membrane structures. This whole complex, RAB connectin 3, alpha, beta, and CAPS, are invo involved in modulating the pH of dense core vesicles, likely by promoting the assembly of VATPase into a proton pumping state. There's a lot of ways to continue forward with these studies, and I, they kind of fall in two categories. We can learn more about CAPS interaction with vesicles, and we can learn more about its involvement in, um, in pH in dense core vesicle pH. 
So I'll talk about how we could further define CAP's interaction with vesicles first. This is actually a project being undertaken by Stephanie in my lab. And she has identified, well, I should say first, we know that in addition to interacting with dense core vesicles via its N-terminal domain uh, with RAB-connectin-3 beta, we also know that CAPS makes a C-terminal interaction with dense core vesicles. And we can see that in control cells, CAPS is punctate. But if you knock out the last 135 amino acid of CAPS, it becomes soluble, suggesting that the C-terminus also mediates an association with vesicles. Stephanie is currently undertaking work to identify a minimal dense core vesicle targeting domain. She can then purify this recombinant fragment and do immunoprecipitations with the fragment as bait to identify what other interaction partners CAPS has on vesicles. Additional work could address what domains of CAPS interact with RAB-connectin-3 beta. We would also, of course, because we're very interested in the priming and exocytosis of dense core vesicles, we could learn how CAPS interaction with RAB-connectin-3 beta affects its priming function. And then finally, we know that at the time of um, regulated exocytosis, at the time of vesicle fusion, CAPS actually dissociates off of the vesicles. It would be interesting to know what the RAB-connectin-3 complex was doing at this time as well. There are also another, a number of additional studies we could undertake to learn more about um, the acidification of dense core vesicles and how CAPS and RAB-connectin-3 are involved in it. One study would be to really kind of nail down this mechanism um, to really test to see whether CAPS and RAB-connectin-3 alpha and beta knockdown impair VATPase assembly. And so you could do this by making knockdown cell lines and then lysing the cells and pelleting their membrane fraction. You would assume that in knockdown conditions, um, when RAB-connectin-3 alpha, beta, and CAPS are knocked down from these cells, that if BATPase were destabilized, that the V1 domain would be in the supernatant, whereas if the complex were able to assemble just fine, that V1 would be in the membrane fraction. Another way you could perform these studies would be to make these cell lines and then um, you do a microscopy assay in which you transfected them with a V1 subunit um, tagged with GFP and quantified whether this was able to localize to membrane or whether it was soluble. And this would again tell you something about the stability of the complex. Additionally, I showed you those two papers at the beginning of my talk, how CAPS was involved in um, dense core vesicle, potentially CAPS was involved in dense core vesicle biogenesis, as well as how CAPS was also maybe involved in catecholamine uptake. You could measure, you could knock down CAPS in the RAB-connectin-3 complex and see if this impacted either dense core vesicle biogenesis or catecholamine loading to try and understand um, the importance of these proteins in maintaining the pH gradient. And so with that, I would like to um, extend some acknowledgments. I first want to thank my advisor, Tom Martin, uh, for the opportunity to work in his lab over the past several years. I've learned a lot from Tom over the years. I think probably the most important things that I'll uh, carry with me throughout my scientific career are the import importance of patience um, in experimental design, in running the experiments, and in analyzing the data. Um, the importance of thinking before you start talking, <laughs> uh, how you need, if you can explain something well, you only have to explain it once, so you should choose your words carefully. Um, and then finally, the importance of being optimistic, that um, knowing that if you have a good hypothesis and you do good science, that uh, you will eventually happen upon something that will be good and people will care about. And so I, I do try and, and keep those things in mind. I thank my lab mates, both past and present. I thank Manny and Connor, who directly contributed to the work that I showed you today. I also thank Declan, Stephanie, and Masaki for their contributions to the second chapter of my thesis, which I didn't have time to talk about. But it was really kind of fun to try and put all of our data together and form a, a nice story about, again, CAPS interaction with vesicles. I thank all of my lab mates for providing a, a really nice supportive environment um, for helping me with protocols and giving me cells and plasmids, um, but also just being very kind and encouraging and um, just helping me figure out what I should be doing. I thank the core facilities, um, the microscopy core. Elle was actually initially my lab mate. I think that she showed me how to turn on this very simple confocal microscope like 10 times my very first year in graduate school. 
but I've certainly uh, graduated on to more complicated microscopy techniques, and I'm, I'm grateful for all of her help throughout all of it. I also thank Greg and Greg from the Mass Spec facility. Um, that Mass Spec experiment was my first big experiment in grad school, and I was very nervous about it. I didn't really know um, how to analyze the data or how to work up the materials. Um, they were extremely helpful, um, and I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you. I thank my thesis committee. Um, I particularly thank John, Sebastian, and Bill for being here today, and I thank my whole committee for uh, helping me throughout this process and for helping me push this project forward, particularly in the last year, because I'm really proud of the strides that I've been able to make. I, of course, thank then my funding sources. And I did want to take a moment to offer a couple more personal thank yous. Um, I wanted to thank my friends. I came to Wisconsin because um, it had a really good reputation for science, but when I met all the, all the scientists here, I thought they were really nice people and people that I could be friends with. And so I've met a lot of really wonderful people, and um, I picked up a lot of really random hobbies, too. Like, I learned how to bike and how to, like, play Frisbee. Um, I play really nerdy board games, um, and I can drink just a lot of beer and make a lot of comments about it um, that sounds snobby. So all of these things, I'm grateful for my friends for um, being supportive when things were hard and for um, celebrating with me when things were good. And then finally, um, I thank my family. So uh, my parents came today. They're from, like, Philadelphia area, so it was kind of a long a long trek, um, but I'm really happy they were able to come, and I hope that presentation made sense. Um, I appreciate your support throughout my graduate school career and, of course, throughout my entire life. I'm so grateful. And um, I thank my partner, Ben, um, who has kind of seen me through each step of graduate school from joining this lab all the way through um, preparing this presentation. There's a lot of really great things about Ben, but the first time any of my friends meet him, they always comment on how like calm he is. And it's really true because I feel like I would always come home from work and I would be all frazzled and you know, not sure I wanted to go back the next day. And I would talk to Ben for like five minutes and I'd be like, all right, you know what, I got this. I'll, I'll go back tomorrow. Um, so thank you for all of your support. And uh, with that, I also thank all of you for uh, coming and for listening. And I would be happy to take any questions. Where on the end terminus? No, I haven't tried to parse down um, that interaction region. Um, is, that, is that your question? Yeah, I know the regions now outcome. I haven't. No, just that assay that I showed. I mean, the, um, that longer end terminal piece seemed to interact better than the shorter end terminal piece. And so it's possible that it might be kind of like, you know, in the middle of that, of that long end terminal piece. But yeah, I, I haven't tried to parse it down any further. Yes, uh, that is a great question. As far as like how many protein, protons are in that dense core vesicle, um, I'm not sure if anyone knows that particular information. But definitely there are free protons uh, within the dense core vesicle, as well as protons that are kind of accumulated within that dense core. Um, sorry, what was your other question? What forms the dense core? Yeah, like other, other than proteins, is there like metals or anything that make it? Ooh. Are there metals? I honestly am not sure about whether or not there, there are metals. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Upon uh, knockdown, is that what you mean? No, upon like a stimulus or in different cell types. Oh, well, there's certainly, um, so for example, CAPS is only really expressed in, in neurons and uh, as well as a number of other cell types. So that, that's certainly a, a very particular protein to certain cell types. And the RAB connectin 3 
alpha protein is also kind of specifically in brain and um, insulin secreting cells. I'm not, I'm not as sure about the beta sum unit, but I would assume that it would be expressed in the same sorts of cell lines. That's a good question. Um, I know that there is a system on endosomes. Um, it's called Ar Arno, this protein Arno ARF6. And those proteins apparently can respond to uh, some kind of change in the structure of VATPase once the endosome is fully acidified. And um, it's known that their binding to endosomes is dependent upon the pH gradient. Um, that's the only that's the only protein that I, I know that's really been tested as far as as far as that. This one comes from an online listener. <laughs> so look towards the camera as you answer. Okay. Um, do you think this might be true for the model that you're proposing might have some analog in synaptic vesicles where there is a similar protein to caps? And do you, can you speak to that at all? So Rabconectin-3, alpha, and beta are thought to also localize to synaptic vesicles. Um, our lab does not tend to think that CAPS localizes to synaptic vesicles, although that's, uh, some people do think that. Um, as far as what the synaptic version of, as far as how Rabconectin-3, alpha, and beta are regulating the acidity of synaptic vesicles, um, I don't think that's ever really been looked at. I don't, think, I don't think the involvement of these proteins in acidifying synaptic vesicles has been really looked at at all, actually. Yeah. I looked Yeah, I, I looked for that really hard <laughs> in the literature. Uh, but you know, I, I couldn't, if there is, I could not find that paper. Um, but I also really want to know that. Um, how how deacidified do these things need to get before everything messes up? I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. <laughs>